Hello my urban gardeners, healers, witches, and shamans, for all are welcome in my little ritual apothecary. This video is the practical side of herbal tincture workings. It's some of the things I do when preparing to work with an herbal decoction, syrup, tincture, elixir, etc. for the first time, regardless if it's for magical or healing purposes. For as I'm very fond of saying, the healing actions of an herb do not turn off because your intentions are spiritual or magical. This also means regardless of intended use, ensure you have checked with your medical practitioner before deciding to work with any botanicals. That said, here are a few things I personally consider when making my herbal tinctures. One, first, and you won't be surprised by this, research, including contraindicators, and always consult your doctor. This is one of the key tips I also included in my video on setting up your apothecary. You can jump to that one through the link above or in the description below. Two, determine the best way to access the energy, regardless if for healing or magical use from the herb. For example, are the properties you seek best extracted through water, or alcohol, or both, which is the case in most mushrooms. This will help determine if a syrup, tincture, elixir, or dual extraction might be best for your creation. You'll often hear me speak of dual extractions, and that will be coming up in a future video. Three, look up the herbal actions. This helps you understand the impacts the herbs will have on or in your body. For example, which organs it may have an impact on or how it may affect your blood. Will it have a thinning effect on it? Will it affect insulin production in your body? If you have a pre-existing condition that is monitored by allopathic drugs or herbal remedies, you will not want to take additional herbs that have the same properties as the ones you're already using or opposite energies which can cancel out the ones you're using. For example, if you're on heart medication, herbs that are vasodilators or cardiostimulators can result in contraindicators for you. You also need to know if the herb can affect absorption of medications that you're on. These are often herbs described as demulcents. They are rich in mucilage and can, for example, soothe and protect gastric lining, but as a result can affect the absorption of other herbs and medications. They usually recommend taking things such as marshmallow roots a few hours before or after allopathic or other herbal remedies. Four. Research the energetics and tastes of the herbs. I find these really helpful to determine if they will pacify or aggravate different issues within my body. It's definitely helpful if you begin to research and work with Ayurveda as a system of healing and creating medicines, but it's definitely not limited to Ayurvedic practices. The energetics of an herb can, for example, explain if it is heating, cooling, astringent, moist, or drying to name a few. The tastes indicate if it is sweet, bitter, sour, etc. As a side note, I have found that understanding the actions, energetics, and even tastes of the herbs speak to the magical and spiritual offerings that they can provide as well. In fact, I've been working on a magical herbal action chart based on my ongoing research in this way. Five creating your bottle labels. Since I do reuse my bottles, ensuring they are properly cleaned and sterilized is key, but I really hate fighting to remove the old labels, so I found a far more efficient way of doing it. It's also more informative. Instead of placing my labels on the bottle, I place them on a tag that I tie around it. Once the tincture is strained and ready for use, I can then use the same tag and simply tie it onto the dropper bottle. What details do I include on my tags? Hmm. After several years, I have found what works best for me. I include the common name, the start and date of the infusion, and a best buy or expiry date. But my tags are two-sided. On the flip side, I include the herbal information as it pertains to me and my uses directly. I used to include contraindicators and do recommend that as reminders if you're starting out, but in time you'll be able to tell from the action list itself what a contraindicator will be. And 
a little bonus tip, straining your creations. One thing I also don't see in tips for making tinctures is what to do once they're done. Based on my own experiences of struggling with any infusion is the straining through the cheesecloths. They can slide down and contaminate what you already strained. They can break as you try to squeeze out the last drops of liquids and then you're starting all over again. And there's the amount of liquid that gets left behind absorbed in the cheesecloth. I have a simple tip for you. It might require a one-time set of purchases, but in the end, you will save a lot both in cost and loss of the tinctures that you make. I use a teapot and or vessel such as these that you'll see in the video and a fine mesh stainless steel tea strainer. I need to start by saying this is definitely not sponsored, but the glass kettle vessels and strainers that I use are all from David's Teas. They are a Canadian company, but do have an online store that I know ships to the States and might also ship internationally. I should have checked that before I started recording this. I'm sorry about that. What I love about this approach is I find I lose far less liquid in the process and the strainer and vessels can all be sterilized. I'm not always comfortable with knowing if and how the cheesecloths might be sterilized. I'm admittedly anal in these things. I like cleanliness, especially in dealing with self-care and healing productions. If you do prefer cheesecloths, here's another tip. Instead of layering the cheesecloths over a strainer, over a bowl, you can unscrew the top of the mason jar, remove the solid round part, I don't really know what it's called, and instead place the cheesecloth over that and then screw the external part of the cap back on. Then you just simply pour it out. Flip it over onto the strainer at an angle so the mouth of the jar isn't completely covered and allows for airflow and it will strain beautifully. It will take time and you may have to check on it, which is another reason I love the stainless steel strainers. Because I'm usually in ritual when I make my creations, I can flip it over and let it strain and be free to add my magic. So that's it for the practical side. If you're also a healer, spirit worker, etc. and like to connect with plant spirits in a ritual way, then here's another bonus tip during the tincture creating process that can definitely apply to oil infusions as well. On a nightly basis, I visit my infusions and repeat a simple prayer of both gratitude and intentions as I give them a shake. Once a week, generally on a weekend, when I have more time, they get a full ritual charge with incense or sprays and or oil offerings. The incense or sprays are used to smoke the energy around the jars and the oils to add sigils to the lid as a form of feeding the spirits of the botanicals. I generally use Reiki symbols, but you can use sigils, runes, or any other type of energy symbols that work for you. If you're making a new batch or a ritual tincture or anointing oil, for example, you can use some of the existing batch to feed the spirits as I find this helps keep the frequency of vibrations in sync. There is definitely a lot more to the process, but I hope one or two, hopefully more, of these tips will be helpful in your own journey with plant spirit medicine, regardless if it's for healing, magical, and or spiritual use. For me, it's usually a combination of all of the above. Please let me know if you plan to try any of them or if you have any additional tips that you can share with us in the comments below. As always, I encourage us to learn and grow together. Many blessings and I'll see you next time in the Ritual Apothecary.